what was it like having to interact with your kids going through that? Yeah, so, you know, it was all consuming. It's, you're right, you're already busy enough doing your job, and then you add this incredibly invasive, life-changing event like a, a court case or being, you know, convicted of something you didn't do. And it really took almost everything from me, almost including my family. There was a, a time when my oldest daughter, who was five when I was going through this, came down into my little basement office. So you got to understand, I'd spend my my nights, my weekends, my free time trying to, A, you know, resurrect everything that my choices had brought. And, you know, they were my choices. He was the business partner I brought on. I didn't vet him. I didn't have user level permissions. I let AR and AP be controlled by the same. Anyway, my stuff, and I'm, I'm down there trying to just you know, pay the mortgage and and stay out of jail. And my oldest daughter comes padding down in her pajamas and with her little stuffed dog and, and a book and tells me it's it's story time. And I'm so ensconced in just trying to keep myself out of jail that, you know, I kind of push her off and I tell her, you know, hey, what I'm working on is is so, so important. And she looked back up at me with her her little stuffed dog and the book in her hands. And, you know, she's five years old and wearing pajamas and says, when you're done, dad, can I be so, so important? And, you know, that's just the point at which I finally cared about this stuff. And people shouldn't have to go that far into the rabbit hole before they start to pay attention for themselves, their own personal identities, and by extension for their businesses. Hello, you're listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. And I want to welcome you to my show. You know, soccer fascinates me. All three of my kids play travel soccer. And this fall, I will not be coaching my last one for the first time in 10 years. All of my kids play for high-level teams. And the more they play, I wonder, does the quality of the team they play with make a difference, all things being equal for increasing their abilities? I think so. Would a young player reach their potential if they are really, really good but playing for an okay team? It's very interesting to think about because it makes me wonder about careers and life in general. Do you surround yourself with the best people you can? How do you define best? In a sport, you can somewhat define best, but what about business and life? It's worth thinking about. I'm excited to bring to you my guest, John Cilio. It took a while to get John on the show after my team heard him speak at ISACA conference last year. He's a very in-demand speaker and you'll soon see why. John's identity was stolen from his business and used to embezzle $300,000 from his clients. While the thief covered his crimes using his identity, John and his business were held legally and financially responsible for the felonies committed. The breach destroyed John's company and consumed two years of his life as he fought to stay out of jail. In response, John made it his mission to help organizations and individuals protect the data that underlies their wealth. Combining real-world experience with years of study, John became an award-winning author, trusted advisor, and keynote speaker on identity theft, cybersecurity, online privacy, and digital fraud. John helps his clients take control of their data exposure before it's too late. His body of work, which you'll see on the show notes, you can click to his site, includes engagements with the Pentagon, USA Today, Visa, Rachel Ray, the FDIC, Pfizer, 60 Minutes, Homeland Security, Blue Cross, Anderson Cooper, and the list goes on. Organizations of all sizes. John is the president and CEO of the Cilio Group, a think tank devoted to helping organizations secure the data that drives their profits. John graduated from Harvard University with honors and spends his free time with his amazing wife and two highly spirited daughters. Some of the major takeaways and principles that John and I cover in this episode is why you start with why with IT security. Security starts with the person behind the social security number. John gets into that. He also talks about the difference between offense, the CIO, and defense, the CISO, and the importance of splitting these roles in two so you don't have defense reporting to offense. Also, renting CISO services versus buying and the power of building a habit into your security program, building one new habit and the power that, that can have. 
the importance of company culture and IT security. Also celebrating IT security wins with the same vigor that you celebrate a sales victory at the highest levels in the organization. We go through three ways to protect your data from ransomware. He reviews some really stunning statistics of the people he studied who have paid the ransom versus the actual percentage of people who received the key to unlock their data. He reviews the neuroscience of IT security and also the greatest threat protection you can have in the role of HR within your organization. I've linked up all about John on the show notes page, which is at redzonetech.net forward slash podcasts, where you have all the links to his books and his videos and ways you can contact him. Thank you for listening to this show and please enjoy my fun and wide ranging discussion with John Cilio. Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone Podcast. I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of exponential technologies, business innovation, entrepreneurship, thought leadership, enterprise IT security, neuroscience, philosophy, personal development, and more. Welcome to the show. Let's get started, and I want to welcome you to the show today. It's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, I know. It's taken us a while to get together, and I'm super excited we're able to, to connect. We've got to start this out with your story. And, you know, your book, Privacy Means Profit, really a wonderful book. We're going to talk about more of the book as we go along, but I, you've got to share with listeners the story of how this all began and sort of like you're this front end leader right now of this movement in privacy. And where did this all begin? Yeah, I, Bill, I kind of got started by making all of the mistakes really early on that we now see, you know, all the way up through the corporation and in government. And 10, 12 years ago, I had a case of personal ID theft where a uh, crime ring called the Cashman stole my identity out of my garbage after a uh, buying a new home. When, you know, back then you throw away copies of documents, don't even think about it. And a woman purchased my stolen identity and used it to buy a home and commit some crimes in my name and drain my accounts. And, you know, it was basically kind of a garden variety, dumpster diving type incident. And after that, you know, I took kind of the basic steps we all do, got a shredder, froze my credit, you know, did a couple of things, but I never made the jump to my business. So I had started a, a software business with my rock climbing partner, my very good friend, Doug. And it was a spinoff of a family business that I had taken over after being in management consulting. And it turns out that Doug, uh, this close friend, rock climbing partner, person holding my life 60 feet in the air, used my identity to embezzle from all of our clients, close to a half a million dollars from our clients. So it looked like me, but it was him. And I then spent the following two years in a criminal trial being the lead suspect and pretty much destroyed everything. Uh, destroyed our, here it was a 40 year old family business in Denver, it destroyed the reputation of that business, destroyed the, the actual business, lost three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 because we paid back the clients who had been harmed. Doug, my partner, never paid so much as a penny. He declared bankruptcy. And in that, I realized all of these things, this connection between our personal security and our workplace, our business security. And, you know, this phenomenon that it's all selfish. Security is selfish. It's not a department. It's not a job description. It's it's kind of this emotion of how you protect what's important to you. For me, I lost, you know, I lost two years with my family. I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I lost my business. I lost kind of everything. And that has given me a, a really neat platform from which to share with people because I am the one who's vulnerable. I am the one who's made the mistakes, who can kind of share this outward and say, listen, don't do what I did. Think about this before it's too late. And it's given me this amazing career speaking around the world to conferences, especially you know when I need to light the fire under, under a technical crowd or under a leadership crowd who doesn't quite see, hey, this isn't just about me. This is about uh, my job. This is about our company. This is about, you know, societal goodness. Yeah. You know, we talk about this from your story and I, and I went on uh, your site and I listened to your, I think it was a 60 minutes clip or, or 
or something, you talking about the story in more detail. And it made me go back to when I got sued. I had over $800,000 stolen from my organization. And and I don't think people generally understand the impact that fighting a lawsuit has on one's life. I mean, you, you're out there trying to take care of customers, bringing in revenues, paying expenses, dealing with employees, you know, all the, who say all the normal, all the regular stuff that you expect an entrepreneur. And then you throw in lawsuits on top of that or a lawsuit. When you were talking, the emotion brought me back to what was it like having to interact with your kids going through that? Yeah. So, you know, it was all consuming. It's, you're right. You're already busy enough doing your job. And then you add this incredibly invasive life-changing event like a, a court case or being, you know, convicted of something you didn't do. And it really took almost everything from me, almost including my family. There was a, a time when my oldest daughter, who was five when I was going through this, came down into my little basement office. So you got to understand, I'd spend my my nights, my weekends, my free time trying to, A, you know, resurrect everything that my choices had brought. And you know, they were my choices. He was the business partner I brought on. I didn't vet him. I didn't have user level permissions. I let AR and AP be controlled by the same. Anyway, my stuff and I'm, I'm down there trying to just, you know, pay the mortgage and, and stay out of jail. And my oldest daughter comes padding down in her pajamas and with her little stuffed dog and, and a book and tells me it's it's story time. And I'm so ensconced in just trying to keep myself out of jail that, you know, I kind of push her off and I tell her, you know, hey, what I'm working on is is so, so important. And she looked back up at me with her her little stuffed dog and a book in her hands. And, you know, she's five years old and wearing pajamas and says, when you're done, dad, can I be so, so important? And, you know, that's just the point at which I finally cared about this stuff. And people shouldn't have to go that far into the rabbit hole before they start to pay attention for themselves, their own personal identities, and by extension for their businesses. Yeah, this is a dark place you went to. And I think the gift, like is clearly the gift from this is that your your passion for, for education and helping people not go through that, that same experience. And it's no small point as well, not only the impact of, uh, but the ethics that that you went out to try to repay these pieces and take personal responsibility. I mean, there's just so much uh, positive wins that came out of this. And of course, years ago that it wasn't a win in your basement, but now just even a look at it from almost like the hero's journey that you went through. Yeah, it's been a journey. And I can't say that I'd want to go through that again and have those several years of, of sleepless nights and fears of going to jail and of bankruptcy and you know, all the other stuff that comes with that. But I'll tell you what, I consider myself one of the lucky ones that I, I get to go to these amazing places to speak to people and meet amazing people who, by the way, many of which, like yourself, Bill, have had an experience of some sort. And man, if we can tap into those personal experiences that CEOs and CISOs and, and you know, everybody have had, that's where the real power comes from. That's a, a transformative connection between the personal and the, the professional. Yeah, and that's what I found really unique about your book and your message is that you take, and you're very clear about this, the taking this personal impact and then linking it back to the business because at times it can seem so antiseptic. You know, oh, it's a big corporation. They just had theft. Well, you really don't, or identity theft, they just got hacked. It's just so, it's so you become dull to it. But you have this resonant story. It was that how did you link the two together to make it unique for you? You know, I think it was so clear to me at some point that security starts in the heart. And as I traveled around to these organizations that have breach or are preparing for breach, you know, to the targets and the anthems and these conferences that I speak at, I started to understand that they all thought that security started in the head that it's somehow a policy or a procedure or an academic pursuit. But for you and I, for the person handling the data every day, it's our connection to our kids' Facebook page or to how much information they're sharing with geotagging or you know, letting people know that we're out of town because of something we post or how we protect our smartphone. That's where we actually care about this stuff. 
And it's been 10 years of, you know, 100 presentations a year and meeting with the people afterwards to understand what they really care about is the personal and they're certainly willing to expand that into their workplace but don't start with the workplace because you're talking into deaf ears start with kind of the why of security the you know for me my daughter letting me know hey dad you're not here for me anymore and that's what we're protecting that's what's at the end of the social security number the credit card numbers the breached database and I noticed also in, in some of your talking, uh, John, that you bring humor into this, but it's a very unique type of humor where, well, maybe you can explain. I noticed your audiences were actually kind of lighthearted while you covered this very serious topic. Again, was that something that you crafted intentionally or is that just your style of making a point and not being uh, so dreaded about it? Maybe you can share a little bit about that. You know, I think there's kind of layers of the onion on this one. It's a serious topic, right? And it's also kind of generally a dry topic, as you mentioned. And to present it in the same old way, death by PowerPoint, doesn't work. So I've done, in addition to, you know, doing years and years of research on these topics, on cybersecurity and, and data protection, I've also looked a lot at the delivery, the pedagogy of it. So you know, first and foremost, I'm a, a professional speaker. I'm there to wow the audience, to get them to take even one step to, you know, the most important thing for me is that they walk out of the room doing one thing. And if I can interact with them and make them laugh rather than preach at them and stand on a soapbox about all of this, they remember it. They walk out and, you know, one of my signature moves is called hogwash. And I go out and I socially engineer the audience <laughs> two, three, four, five times to show them how difficult it is when a professional is working on you for information. And I'll tell you what, they walk out of that conference and they chuckle and they say hogwash to each other throughout the rest of the conference. And it just builds and builds and their brain chemistry changes. And, you know, it's the humor that people connect with and, and they love that interactive aspect. Yeah, that's great. I mean, my team, we're, we're a bunch of security gearheads here. And my CTO, of course, is the leader of the bunch. And when he came in, came back and started talking about, I've got to see you, i got to see you. I was like, but it's it's not your typical speaker, James. And he's like, no, this guy is so good. So it's interesting. And it seems like you're transcending both the business audience and the deep technical audience as well. We really need to grab both audiences, which is fantastic. Yeah, well, listen, most people in my audiences in that type, you know, at that ISOC conference or another technical conference, honest to God, these people know more than I do. They're more <laughs> versed in the topic than I do. What they don't have is the benefit of that kind of human element perspective. They don't have the benefit of seeing if you shift your thinking, God, even 45 degrees from what you have now, all of that knowledge you have built in, and you apply it in a slightly different aspect through the view of a human being, not through the view of a corporation, everything changes. The culture of the organization, the culture of security, the habits that people are willing to build, the behavioral changes that come on that, that is what makes a sea change and it makes it quickly. And you know, companies and corporations and even the Department of Defense that I've done a ton of work with, they see how powerful it is to have it be that method rather than just sheer information. So let's talk about this culture of privacy, which again, I found very unique. Sometimes it can get so dry and so boring and so non-transformational, just reading checklists and tasks and to-dos and these lists of things that you need to, to protect against. Walk us through your idea of building a culture of privacy. I think of it as a web, kind of a, a web of culture. So there's human aspects of it. There are physical aspects, physical security. There are technological aspects, the devices, and there's kind of this networked or internet aspect. And those four areas weave together. And I always start with the humans. And frankly, in an organization that doesn't have a culture of security in any way, I start with the top. So my very most important audience is the 10 people on the board of directors or the leadership team sure. or the, the entrepreneurial team, whoever it is, because they don't understand. If they don't get that Sophie moment, that's my daughter's name, that <laughs> moment where you lose it all and you have no idea what just happened to you. If they don't understand security, they don't fund security. And 
you've got to have that buy-in on the board. I mean, look at Target. Did they have a, a CISO on the board before the breach? No. Is that a major cultural red flag in terms of? Yes. If the board's not talking about where they are in terms of, of identifying their, their most valuable data and what they're doing to protect it, they're not a benchmark best in practice company yet. And so getting that board buy-in and then really it comes down to you have to serve your people first. So, you know, when I go around and, you know, Pfizer's a great example. Pfizer brought me to speak at every campus that they had because they understood that if you don't get those people one by one interested in this and you do that by starting with their security, by getting them interested in security, period, whether it's corporate or personal, and building that from the bottom up of, hey, this stuff matters. And by the way, it's your job. It's your responsibility. And, you know, I soft shoe those type of recommendations because I don't want to be preachy. But when they come out, they know that their job depends on the way that they're protecting that data. And building from the top down and then the bottom up culturally, that's really what changes things. And then from there, you kind of have to habituate people in the right ways. Well, you know, I'm so glad you brought this up because one of the big reasons I go to some of the top security conferences is not that I or my company is working with Coke, Pepsi, Pfizer. You know, these are supposedly have the best of the best IT security professionals, fully staffed. I'm going to them because I want to hear what they're talking about to apply it to the small to medium enterprise, the 10 person to the the 10,000 employee company. Because what's interesting is we can't scale security devices. But when you go to individuals, that's a much quicker return. If you go to the board and say, I'm going to educate your people and it's going to make you 30% safer because you're educated, you can scale knowledge into people fast versus having to buy 55 security devices for uh, $7 million. Totally. And I don't know if you've read Power of Habit. Uh, oh, by Do Doig? Do it. Do it. Do yeah. 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 And, and the story of Alcoa and Paul O'Neill, who took over this failing company that was, you know, way below earnings and changed one factor, took one keystone habit, which was worker safety, right? So he takes this one habit and it ripples out and it changes the level of quality, you know, their quality control. And it changes the way that people feel about the job because they're now safer on the job. And it here, several years later, they've got 500% profitability of what they had before because he looked at one really important habit. Well, guess what? Phishing is that habit or password protection can be that habit. And if you do it right, you can have that spread like wildfire where you put it out to the managers and it builds from there. And guess what? If you learn phishing, you've learned the basics of social engineering. If you've learned social engineering, you don't pick up the USB drive in the parking lot. You don't let the person in with a handful of donuts at the back door after a smoke break. You know, <laughs> those you don't take the phone call saying this is your IT department. We need to get into your computer. It's so pervasive once they get the basics. But God, you got to give them the basics. Yeah, though that you know, it's funny. I I haven't read the whole book for Do Doig's book, but I have it staring at me in the mornings. But I have read enough of the book to read that story. And that story, so funny you picked up. That's a really powerful story. How one, it actually doesn't even follow a pattern that you think a CEO would tackle, like worker safety, increased profits. I mean, they probably thought he was crazy, but it sort of follows an interesting path, John, because you're right. If you educate people not to click things they shouldn't be clicking, and why? You eliminate rent, potentially eliminate ransomware or decrease the likelihood by massive percentage points, much more frequent than just having a fancy toy that you buy. I say yes. fancy toy. I don't want to belittle security technologies, but the fact is people, to the point, it's a habit if we habitually train people like you've done at Pfizer, then that, that has a ripple effect, which is so powerful. Yeah, and I'm, I'm with you. You don't want to belittle the technology and the intrusion detection and the data loss prevention. That's all a part of it. But I know the emotion that you're coming from, which is there's so much focus on that that we forget the other. And so, yes, is that part of the web of security? Yes, it is. But we're all kind of already taking care of that or have started taking care of that. What we haven't done is to train you know, Fazio mechanical to uh, to not allow access into target servers and, you know, third party access and carelessness in the workplace and even, you know, vetting out maliciousness in the workplace, the, the inside mole job or those type of things. So 
I'm so glad to, to hear you say we we can't focus so much on the equipment and the, the technology that we forget who wields that technology. Well, exactly right. And in your book, you go through some st- statistics that I want to ask you about. But what's interesting is, you know, the human error. It's funny the they had to address human errors because people were dying in operating rooms, not because of the surgery, but because of the infections that were caused by human error. And this is a mass, massive problem, people dying. But I think human error is the issue that what you're addressing is how do we fix human error by training and by educating and by making it uh, personal. And I think what a powerful platform that you're on right now. Yeah, I'm really happy to be in this spot. So let's talk about CIOs for a second, because there was a, a quote in here that said of the C. EOs, so with the E, 53% said that the CIO is responsible for data protection, yet only 24% of C-levels would point to the CIO as the one responsible for data protection. So I thought that was, and then of those who are said to be in charge of data protection, 85% wouldn't believe that a failure to stop a data breach would impact their job. Wow. So I was reading this in your book and I thought, well, that's true. I mean, I believe that. I actually believe it. But you'd have to have the assumption that a CIO would believe that they are, or a CISO, if they've broken that job off from the CIO, that could actually believe that they could stop a data breach. So I want to share a provocative opinion here that is mine only, but I'd love to hear back. And, and I don't know if you have a spot for your listeners to comment, but to me, security is not the CIO's job ever ever, ever. The CIO to me is an offensive coordinator. uh, And that's a term that I take from Tom Kellerman, formerly of Trend Micro, and he now now has a VC for security stuff. But CIO is offensive. They are going out and they're looking how to utilize information to better their business, the big data side of it. The CISO or a chief risk officer or, or whoever that person is that's responsible for security, that is a defensive position in my viewpoint. Currently, the defense dangerously reports to the offense. So on a board level structure, the CIO is probably sitting at the table and the CISO is probably not. Or if so, it's a relatively new thing and they're not as much listened to. Those people have two functions that do not necessarily come to the same conclusion. Now, Obviously, you have to have in both of those positions business-minded people who understand that it's a compromise between the use of information and the protection of information. But you have to have both voices at the table, in my opinion. So when an executive says they don't see the, the CIO as having that position, I'm with them, but it's for a different reason. It's because I see a separate, you know, in, in the average corporation now, I don't care if you're a business of 10 or a mega corporation multinational of hundreds of thousands, you've got to have somebody that is representing the voice of security. And the person who's representing the voice of more and more data is not meant to be that person. I would agree with you. And I think that that, the bigger the company, the more that's happening. I I see it happening slowly on the, more slowly on the small to medium, which I think is the reason why your opinion is, it really needs to be heard because it's not happening at the lower, at the small and medium business as fast as it should. Would, would you agree? Well, nothing does because we're all, you know, all of us small businesses, entrepreneurs, medium, we're just, you know, we're serving in every position. So let me give you a good example of how you solve that. And by the way, everything we're talking about in my estimation has a solution. So the, the whole fear, you know, too much fear about this, we can't win deer in headlights. It's got no place if you're taking some really smart steps. For the entrepreneur out there who's listening for even a medium-sized business, you can have a CISO that is external. You can have a tech person who knows about penetration tests, who knows about, you know, doing a, a cyber audit, who sits in your what, once a quarter, once a year meeting and represents security, the security perspective. Do you have to trust that person? Of course. Do you have to vet them? Of course, just like you would an employee. But you don't necessarily have to have them on staff 365 days a year to have security represented on your board. And what I see in a lot of companies now, and heck, my company is one. I took one of my businesses over from my parents. I'm the younger kid. I'm the one that was versed in some technology. 
guess what? I'm the one that gets to head up security and be the, the one that makes sure that we bring in an external security audit and get the firewall set up. And do I do it all myself? No. Do I hire some externally? Yes. So there's no excuse there for not having that voice in your executive team. I would agree with you. And I don't think people understand. I, I call it a rent a CISO. You can rent it. You can rent that service. And, and I don't mean to belittle the word rent, but I think you can, like you're saying, you can take it on fractionally because some people don't have 150000 175000 a year to, to spare with a fully uh, vetted and trained uh, CISO on staff. Yep. So I like your perspective on CIO as an offensive role and the need for a, a, a defensive role to emerge that reports up through risk or reports directly to the CEO or to um, COO, for example. So I, I love that perspective. As far as building a culture of privacy, what other elements to privacy and building a culture do you see within an organization being relevant to having to come from the CEO or having to come from the board of directors? Is there anything that's critical to building it that the CISO or the CIO can't do themselves that they just need organizational support for? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, you know, it starts with the executives. You know, think of the Sony COO emailing username and password and, and so forth through the system and setting that culture. But I have to say, if you haven't built the team around you, and by the way, these principles are going to start to to sound repetitive, and that's because they are totally repetitive. You know, the buy-in of a team beneath you that implements it and that is excited about security, not psycho, not fear-mongering, not it's got to be my way or the highway, but hey, let's sit down and have a conversation as manager, worker, and an awareness session. And you know what? Let's get your mobile phone protected. Did you know You know, 60% of you right now don't have a passcode on that? And let me show you how I can get into your bank account in 45 seconds since you don't have a passcode. That's something that I do in my, my presentations. And guess what? When they can get into that bank account, they can also call as you into the office. And they can represent themselves as as you on email because you've got email on that smartphone and they can take over that email account, you know, and you bridge from that, again, from that personal to that private. So the CEO sets the tone. The CEO is is the one that when they talk about it at the annual meeting, you know, when they get up and they say this is important and then they bring in a speaker or they have, you know, some sort of topical focus on security in general, it shows that they're putting their money where their mouth is and that sets the tone. But all the real work is done down in the trenches. I mean, the people that I work with are generally the IT or the security team who need to send the message more broadly. And, you know, even beyond what I do, that's where the real work, because this is all about building, you know, excellent habits. This is like within Alcoa, the the worker safety. Well, when you have excellent habits of detecting social engineering, the whole equation of, you know, of manipulation and deception changes. So one of the objections I hear about CIOs or CISOs that want to start educating the user community is generally the CISO is not very powerful in the organization. And even if the CIO is more powerful, they're finding they have to go talk with HR. And then now this is an HR issue. And so you, you sort of now, if they listen to John Cilio speak, they come back, they're fully empowered to start educating employees about cyber risk and giving them practical, useful, personal information to help reduce risk with the company. Now they got to run it through HR and go through, a, and now it's like a dead horse they're carrying on their back. How do people get around that? By cooperation and compromise and by a leadership team from the board down through the CEO, down through, you know, whether it's the CIO, CISO, that says, we are doing this. This is not optional. And again, that's why when I recommend where a company start, I want to have that board buy-in first, because when they say this is now an initiative and HR you will be the ones at fault if this initiative isn't carried out at the most detailed level. So obviously this isn't stuff that happens at the conference. At the conference, you generate interest yeah. inside of the corporation, inside of the, the Pfizer or inside of Northrop Grumman or whoever, you know, these companies that I've been inside of. The hard work happens after I walk off of the stage and they're left with the task. So 
take a, a gander at one of the public retirement systems I've worked with. Phenomenal implementation of this. And it's because they've got $40 billion under management. They're not a highly profitable company because they're, they're about public retirement. So they don't have all kinds of extra money to spend. So what do they do? They do regular lunch and learn, have to be there. You know, you get two or three options in the week to be at one of these seminars. And that's what generates interest. Then they utilize a technology like Wombat or something that helps train on phishing schemes, on social engineering. So it takes the basic themes that they've heard in the energy session and it turns it into kind of a um, automated version of, okay, now I care. Now I'm going to click through this and I'm going to pass the test. And then there are cultural incentives. Here's one of the things that gets missed all the time. We'll incent our salespeople to make a sale and make a $10,000 profit. But by God, if we'll incent the whole team for saving us a billion dollar target like breach because we protected the data. And so there's part of the culture there. If you as a business go through and you don't have a major incident, your team is doing something right because every one of you right now is being attacked and penetrated in some way. And if you don't have a massive incident, in a year, you should celebrate your people, you should reward your people and incent them to continue that behavior. And it should be at the highest levels that that's recognized. And so, you know, on the walls of this, um, of this public retirement system, you know, it had pictures of the employees who had a 0% phishing click rate. And it had a chart of, listen, we went from six and a half percent of clicks to less than 0.1% of people clicking on phishing. And by the way, the technology picked up the other 0.1%. So, you know, that kind of championing and blowing the horn when there is success and rewarding it, it's huge in terms of the cultural belief. You walk into a company like Google or Facebook and, you know, you see somebody having to log in with two-factor authentication before they even get on their machine and you say, why are you doing that? And they say, because we're protecting our, our surfers' data. We're protecting our users' data, and they already understand that that's their job and their responsibility, and that's because they've been properly trained. It's consistent. It doesn't have to be expensive. Much of it can be automated, but it's constant. Every year, they have some sort of training on this type of topic. You know, I love that point you just made about rewarding because it's interesting. If the senior VP of sales comes into the CEO and says, I'm going to deliver you $70 million in sales this year from all these various channels. And I have a plus or minus uh, 5%, 2.5% likelihood of that event happening, plus or minus, you know, there's a variance one way or the other. And they're promising this much revenue and for the organization. You know, if you miss that target, if you achieve that target, you're, there's celebratory parties. You, you They send the sales team to uh, exotic locations. You know, there's a lot of, and if you miss it too many times, um, the senior VP is gone. And it's interesting you make this point because the quiet service like IT, the quieter and the more calm the users are, the less people are running down the hallway saying that their computers are broken into or they're too slow. Quietness is actually success. Nothing happening is actually success. And it's almost like they need a set of metrics to, to say, as you were just pointing out, what defines massive success and what's the variance you'll give me within that so that it's very much equivalent to what the senior VP of, of sales would, would have a conversation with the CEO about. Yes. If we could get leaders to think in that way, to think of security as business as usual, you know, to put it on a plane with legal and sales and, and HR and just have it be part of the business and therefore incent and reward. And by the way, feedback. And when somebody fails multiple times, they're let go or they're re-educated first and then let go, whatever. That type of perspective on this would cost so much less than responding to the breach post-event. It makes a exponential difference to kind of slowly start accumulating this security and this privacy in your organization as a culture. So you mentioned that you um, like to rock climb. Do you still rock climb? You know, I don't do much rock climbing anymore. Well, for one thing, I lost my partner, and, and I also lost a little bit of trust in <laughs> knowing the person who's below me. So when I'm with my daughters, yeah, I rock climb. But in general, I've switched to uh, lots of snowshoeing and, and mountain biking and hiking. 
Oh, fantastic. Are there any particular, uh, I know when I, when I run and when I, uh, I find there's a direct correlation. It's almost like a math equation. The more, the longer I run, the better ideas flow into my head. <laughs> oh, no question. Uh, that find, creativity. Oh, what do you think? What, uh, does that happen for you as well? Yeah. In fact, I have, sometimes I have, have to force myself. You know, I get in the, the mode of sitting in front of my screen and responding to emails and all of this stuff that's important, but it's not, there's no actual transformative change there. And I'll force myself to take my snowshoes, to take my hiking boots or whatever. And it's at about mile three or four of, you know, when my brain kind of shuts off and it, it starts to work its magic and actually think through things in a much more creative, broader perspective than if I'm actively trying to think through something. And that's, you know, some people get it in the shower, some people get it on the bike or in a spin class or, or whatever. But what I know without question is when I'm in a patterned behavior. So it could be walking, could be hiking, could be biking. My brain works in a totally different way. You know, it's interesting. There's a lot more research coming out on breathing. And I know, you know, there's all sorts of people talk about breathing and you must breathe and there's yoga breathing and there's people talk about runner's high and things like that. But there's actually like a lot more science coming out because we have more powerful tools for understanding what's going on within the brain and the release of of different neurotransmitters and that oxygenating the body it has an incredibly powerful effect on our whole systems, um, more than just the traditional runner's high perspective. You know, that's so interesting. I start my day in Colorado here by walking out my on my back deck, sitting in a chair, closing my eyes and breathing deep and it just kind of awakening each of my senses one at a time. So I, first thing I do is I smell for whatever reason that, you know, cause it's early morning and it maybe just rained or the flowers or the pine trees. And, and then I listen and then I look and I kind of fill the chair and all of that really is about breathing. And on days when I do that, and it's certainly not every day cause you know, I fall off the wagon as much as anybody, but on the days that I do that, I go into my work with a totally different perspective. And I go into how I treat my wife and kids with a, a different perspective. And I think maybe that has something to say about security, which is, you know, this isn't about panic. This is about breathing your way through the things you don't do well, breathing your way through the failures and finding a resilience that ultimately is way more secure than having built the highest wall. No, I find a huge link for what you just said. I, I think it's actually very important for people like yourself and myself to remind people not to panic because, you know, the amygdala is a very old part of our brain. It goes back to the beginning of time. And, you know, I know a, a woman just saved her daughter or son from being attacked by a mountain lion in Colorado. You know, that's yeah. the that's the old amygdala, you know, with the rustling bush and boom, you know, it's a it's a predator. And, and we think in, in the digital world, you know, the constant chattering of things around us, it, it does trigger that part of our brain. And we need to get out of that and into a more settled, adult-oriented, calm approach. Not to say we're not intensely serious and intent, but you're so right. I think there's uh, reminding people not to be uh, so panicky is, is a huge piece of this. I love that we're talking brain science because, you know, behind all of this laughter that happens in in an audience and the connections and the interaction and stuff is actually the brain science of cortisol and the amygdala and the the prefrontal cortex and i mean there's the basis of social engineering right there if i want to socially engineer you i'm either you know as a woman i'm going to engender your trust as a male i might engender fear and flush your brain with cortisol and what you need to know is hang on slow down breathe deep that's the hogwash reflex right there. Take a minute to think it through. And after about 15 seconds, you start to think, oh my God, of course this is fraud. Of course I shouldn't click on this link. Of course I shouldn't give my username and password to this person on the phone. Of course this isn't my grandson calling for money from jail, but it's all brain science. And if you don't found it in all that we know about how humans work and counteract that amygdala and that response of somebody jumping out of the bush, we're just totally reactive and we never prevent. Yeah, exactly right. And, you know, I think we talked about earlier not poo-pooing the devices because and the technologies because uh, some of them are, are incredibly powerful and, and useful. But I think it's common knowledge now the human weakness is a big piece of this. And, you know, this comes to a larger conversation with artificial intelligence, people getting concerned about 
sort of machines taking over. I think one of the biggest ways machines won't take over is if humans don't panic and actually from the top down start to lay out a strategy of how to approach IT security, which is linking it very much to like VP of sales. And I think this comes back to the CIOs. It's a really, and a CISOs is even a younger profession. I'm sure you know the data on this, but like when was the first CISO landing in the corporate America? I think what, 04, 2004? You know, and when was yeah. the first when was the first VP of sales? <laughs> yeah, pretty I mean, historic. <laughs> pretty, yeah, well, uh, you know, Mesopotamia. I mean, <laughs> so we've had a long history of VP of sales. We need to think mature that or, that uh, CISO role a bit faster. <laughs> well, I think you and I can probably both count on having our jobs for a long time because it is new and it's not going away and. AI and the Internet of Things and robotics and, you know, having every device connected is there's a hard trend, you know, to quote Dan Burris, that's a hard trend that's happening with or without us. It's how we react to that and how we think strategically, which is sorely missing from most corporations, certainly from smaller and, and medium ones, how we think strategically about this. Like you say, stay calm, keep calm and think through how do we build in security? How do we think about these issues when it comes to AI and robotics and the Internet of Things? So let's get real practical for a second. So you have this awesome blog post. Actually, I hit your site and I read three. Maybe we'll only pick on one, but I want to pick on ransomware because it's very technical, yet at the same time, it has a huge social piece, which I think links a lot of our discussion as we start to wrap up. But what I like about this piece is you actually get into practical steps towards the end. But I would love to get your perspective on... Data classification. So someone clicks something they shouldn't have clicked. And now we have an event called files are rapidly being sucked up and encrypted. And, and I want to talk to you about data classification. Like how could a company reverse engineer this so that they would be better prepared to handle ransomware event happening? Because I think ransomware for a lot of people is not a question of if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. You bet. Yeah. So when you reverse engineer it, you understand that there are essentially three things that you have to look at. You've got to look at the human response of clicking on a link or going to a website or opening an attachment on an email that they shouldn't. There's the technological side of detecting it, you know, whether it's in spam filters, phishing filters, intrusion detection, that type of thing. And then there's the old fashioned and terribly effective real-time off-site backups. And the cloud has made that certainly more available. And it's also, you know, there are some security issues with backing up in the cloud. But if you take a look at these hospitals that have been hit in the last six months, this is shutting down life support equipment, not just uh, patient data. And when you freeze up the hospital, you freeze up the ability to save lives. And the ones that have survived well are the ones who already had real-time off-site backups that would allow them, or redundancy, you know, machines that they could sub in, that would allow them to continue or recover so quickly that they didn't have to pay the ransom. And unfortunately, what we're seeing in the clients that we've worked with is 90% of them are paying the ransom. And that does nothing but encourage more ransomware, more cyber blackmail. So until we stop that cycle, because we've got a better answer, we have prepared for it, you know, it's going to continue to grow. It will be, you know, it's going to be the, the new shiny object here in security for the next couple of years. And you did mention that 90% are paying, the, but only 50% are yeah. actually receiving the unlocking key. I never yeah. heard that. Yeah, oh, there's my no gosh. guarantees, right? These are criminals. But the funny part is, even at 50%, in, in some cases, you're receiving better customer service from your ransomware provider than you are from Comcast. So, <laughs> And right now, I just saw one this morning. They've got a chat feature with the purveyor of ransomware. So you can get onto the lock screen and you can chat with them and learn how to buy Bitcoin and pay the ransom. And you can pay it all there on the, the chat screen. So honest to God, this is organized like these people went to Harvard Business School and, and have learned the lessons of great customer service. Well, this blog post is a, is a nice step-by-step -step guide, very accessible. I, also, it's interesting is, you know, what, what we found is that when someone is hit with ransomware, it, it's encrypting files very fast, is that 
you can rent the capability. So if you're a small to medium business out there that – and I think the issue is not that you can't buy the technologies. You need somebody to run it, and you need someone to run it well. And I think there's an average of 46 security technologies in most businesses. It's tough to run them all well. But you can actually rent that service that will watch for abnormal file opens. So you might have a normal pattern of 2,000 file accesses a day. If that spikes within an hour to 6,000, that you can actually have a system that can alert and block that from happening. And you can rent that service from the cloud, from a cloud service provider. And there's there's several out there that do that. But to your point earlier, when you talked about renting the Cisco capability, we can actually rent that capability as well if, if we had that desire. So let me tell you where that generally fails so that people can go one step further because that's an excellent suggestion. Just like Target, who had purchased a multi-million dollar system to detect point of sale malware, and it detected the point of sale malware and it sent that to somebody's inbox who decided to ignore that particular red flag. It's not just the software you need, it's the person, like you said, watching it and letting you know about it and turning the systems off or shutting it down before it becomes a major problem. It goes beyond the technology and into how you utilize that technology and, and implement it in a very consistent way. People are going to laugh when they hear this, but this is going to dovetail what we're talking about. And you can use this story if you'd like. We go through a process for interviewing about 60 different areas for security risk. And one of them is on antivirus. And people are like, why are you asking antivirus questions? And it's like, we don't ask the question, are you running antivirus? Because every person on the staff of that company is going to say, of course you run antivirus. But when you actually peel back the onion and say, okay, are you running on your development and production? Are you running on your cloud service provider? Are you looking at the exclusions? Is there a process where those exclusions go to your help desk and your help desk is watching for failures of, of the antivirus running? Do you update it from your maintenance perspective? I mean, there are so many human being pieces to break the process <laughs> that the human error piece just on simple antivirus gets can get askew. And we've had some, some high-level IT, so the strategy VP of IT is sitting there going, oh my God, I don't ask questions about antivirus because why should I? I'm trying to figure out how to get technology to bring money into the business, not worrying about my antivirus exclusions. Yeah, and there's your offensive versus defensive. Look, you've got to look at both sides and you know the old saw, devil is in the details. Boy, in the digital world, that's really where the devil is, is, is making sure everything is operating properly. So, John, we're going to wrap up here, but this has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, we've covered everything from neuroscience to uh, <laughs> to your book to some board level conversations to you know practical execution of uh, educating people. Um, but what's the message you want to leave for the audience today that you want to leave people with? Maybe you can pretend like you're flying into Denver Airport and there's a John Cilio billboard. What would be the message on that billboard? Oh God, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> Hire me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> the message would probably be don't forget your people. They are, instead of how most articles and tech and security publications refer to them as the weakest link, I think of people as your first line of defense, as your greatest asset protection. The, the people are what differentiate the business. I don't care if it's a, a tech business or an uh, old style retail vendor. It's the people that make the difference, and those who focus on the people will change and will have a competitive advantage. It's all about the people, Bill. I love how you switched it from you. people the biggest weakness, the people are the advantage. And, and uh, again, a, it's a slight twist, but I think it's a much more empowering way to look at it. John, thank you very much. This has been super fun. I'm, uh, it's, we uh, finally connected, and it's been worth it. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I hope that if there's anything else I can do for your for your listeners to help out, that I can do that. Well, we're definitely going to link the show up on the show notes page, share it out on your blog as well, and we'll um, amplify your message. It's very, very powerful, and, uh, and I uh, hope that you can keep continue to spread it into corporate America. And, Fantastic. And, and to individuals. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. So there you have it. That was John Cilio. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with him. You'll find information and resources we discussed on the show notes page at redzonetech.net forward slash podcasts. Also, make sure to check out our sponsor, CIO Security Scoreboard, which offers rent a CISO and virtual CISO services 
if you are a CIO looking to bolster your IT security posture or a CISO looking for a virtual backstop that you can engage at a tactical and strategic level, go to rentacisso.co to learn more. Again, that's rent a c s o rent a ciso dot c o to learn more until next time i'm bill murphy and i'm signing off thank you for listening and have a great day so there you have it this wraps another episode of bill murphy's red zone podcast to get all the relevant show notes please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you.